We need to have an honest conversation with the capital class that says, if you're going to take a job and move it from the United States to the rest of the world, the United States citizens should be compensated for that in one form or another. And for you to further exacerbate it by picking up your tax base and dumping the intellectual property that was created in the United States and putting it into a low tax regime so you can do the, the Dutch flip or the, the uh, you know, take advantage of Ireland's, you know, low tax rates, that's absurd. Mr. Mike Green, welcome to On The Margin. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, Michael. I appreciate it. Yeah, of course. Um, so we're going to talk, I think, about a whole bunch of different pretty interesting things on this show. But really what I'd love to, to kind of start with is kind of U.S.-China relations. Um, and maybe if we could just start from a super high level. Uh, so if you look at the last 50 years of growth uh, from the Chinese perspective, you know, if you kind of look at the, the visit that President Richard Nixon made over to China in 1972, China looked very, very different. Uh, back then. And if you fast forward to today, you know, China is the second biggest economy in the world, uh, arguably the other superpower. How did we get from kind of where China was in 1972 to today? Well, so the primary component is, first of all, Richard Nixon reaching out, you know, part of the Kissinger real politic dynamic was really designed to, um, you know, further the fracture that had occurred between the Soviet Union and China with the Sino-Soviet war and, and dispute following uh, uh, the elevation of Khrushchev, etc. You know, it was a decision that was made largely for political convenience. They were struggling um, with need for resources and for relatively low cost. We could do things like provide them with grain, et cetera, to feed their population. Um, so there was very little interaction and impact for, I would argue, really the first 30 years of that relationship or 20 years of that relationship until China began to emerge as a much more market economy, first under Deng, and then really with the inclusion um, into, uh, you know, the trading relationships that the United States began to develop with China starting in the 1990s. They responded quite aggressively to the North American Trade Pact. That was the initial devaluation of the yuan that occurred in, I believe it was 1994. Um, and from that point, they undercut Mexico as effectively the cheap source of labor, right? right. And once that had occurred, you began to increasingly see the U.S. Um, having won the Cold War effectively. They're no longer being a, uh, a military uh, objective in terms of the former Soviet Union and the United States. We began to embrace a much more economic integration with China, almost in a weird way. We'll talk about this later, but you know, similar to what happened to the Roman Empire after they had finally defeated Carthage and imported a bunch of slaves. And so it's it's politically terrible way to say it, right? And, and about as politically incorrect as you can possibly get. But the influx of 1.4 billion Chinese into the U.S. labor force is not all that meaningfully different from the influx of slaves into the Roman labor force following the, the wars of conquest in you know, the second century B.C. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Carthago Delenda Est. Right? Yeah. I, uh, I get so few uh, opportunities to plug that I was a classics major. So thank you for yeah. giving me that open. I genuinely appreciate it. Um, so uh, my question to you is like, if you look at China today, right, if you look actually, let's start with the American political uh, scene as it stands, right? We're in a super divided uh, political scene right now. It, certainly in my lifetime, the most um, polemicized it's ever felt. Uh, and if you look at bipartisan issues, the list is actually very short. And it seems like um, China or standing up to China is, is kind of number one on that list. When you look at it from the Chinese um, perspective, what are their major strategic imperatives right now? Like what is on a very high level, what is China working towards? Well, the single most important thing from China's perspective, and it goes under the cover of reunification with Taiwan, right? But really what Taiwan represents is the ability to break that first island chain that is effectively a barrier that prevents China from access to the Pacific Ocean. So most people mm -hmm. look at the, at, at the map of China and they see a country that is you know, not as large as the United States physically, but significant geographically. And it appears to have similar coastline to the United States in terms of access to the Pacific Ocean, right? It appears mm -hmm. that it should, there's no reason for it not to be a naval going power. The problem is that China, unlike the West Coast of the United States, has significant barrier islands, the most important one being Japan, but then you move down, you've got Okinawa, Taiwan, the Philippines, et cetera, that are controlled by foreign powers and largely dominated by the relationships with the United States. Those effectively function as a geographical blockade for China's access to deep water facilities, 
They just mm. don't have the ability to put out a blue water navy in the same way that the U.S. does. We have among the most unreal natural point ports in the world on the on the U.S. West Coast. We also have our own on the East Coast. China doesn't have that sort of access. And so the ability, when you talk about one belt, one road and the maritime equivalents associated with it, what they're really talking about is breaking that blockade that is, for better or worse, been in place for about 70 years. Yeah. You, in your great recent interview with uh, Taylor France, you, you kind of actually talked about this reorientation, right? Mm -hmm. And people living in the U.S., let's say we're not known for our uh, geography, our penchant for geography, right, outside of our very little corner of the world. And there's this great reorientation, right? And it's very similar. To, it's kind of a callback to that New Yorker, like how a New Yorker sees the world. Yep. And this is how China sees the world. And it's just such a cool reorientation. Yep. Yeah, Ta Taylor created that chart. Um... I saw it for the first time back in, I think it was 2010. And it is, it really is, I encourage people to check that video out. It's available on YouTube. Um, I don't remember exactly where the mark is for that, for that video, but it is just a phenomenal way to reorient your mind to understand China's priorities. All you're doing is just taking the fact that the, the map is traditionally oriented to the east, right? Which Nobody really thinks about what's on their right side. We're not actually set up for great peripheral vision, but the minute you flip that and you're actually, the east is now north and you're effectively looking out from China, it becomes very clear that dynamic. Taylor also points out, so Taylor Fravel um, is a professor at MIT, a good friend of mine, and we actually went to high school together and played lacrosse together. <laughs> nice. um, so it's a it's coincidence, unintentional, but um, uh, he is one of the foremost thinkers in terms of the geopolitics, in particular the military strategy of the, the um, Pacific region. And his point is one that I make as well, which is China is deeply disadvantaged relative to the United States by virtue of the number of borders that it faces. So right. China borders 17 countries, we border two, right? Ignoring, you know, if you reach across uh, Alaska where you can see Russia from, from Sarah Palin's house. The, it, you know, that type of dominance of a continent plays into a political sphere harkens back to a political theorist from the 19th, early 20th century named Harold Mackinder, Mackinder Global Theory. His focus was on Eurasia, and he was correct in, in articulating that Eurasia is a single landmass that functionally is split in a Nash equilibrium, although he didn't know the term, where there's five superpowers that inhabit that world island, and they're constantly mm -hmm. battling with each other for control of the world island. It's an incredibly politically unstable piece of which the Middle East is one that we typically think of is just one of those components that has been made dramatically more unstable by the other players, right? So Europe basically conquered it. And then when they were unable to hold it, same manner the United States, they intentionally set it up as a series of warring tribes. But by nature, that is the fifth superpower. We may see that emerge at some point over the next couple of years. Yeah. So when you think about different axes of control that China is attempting to exert influence over, so maybe that's like financial infrastructure, maybe it's technology, maybe it's military, trade influence, whatever. What do you think are the most important axes that they're really working on today? Well, I think the axes that they're really working on are, are one, there's an incredible disinformation campaign to keep the United States divided and highlight yeah. the differences between ourselves, right? So you, you, you highlighted that we feel very divided. There's not a lot of stuff that's in the common sphere. Um, China appears to be one of those issues and it's something I've actually worked towards, you know, for the past several years. I'm thrilled to see it develop. But the, the simple reality is actually there's a ton of stuff that's in the common sphere. Right. Mm. Republicans love their children. Democrats love their children. Right. We all want them to be better educated. Right. We want them to have better prospects in the future. We want them to have good employment prospects, et cetera. Now, the problem is that the disagreements on how to achieve that exist. Right. I may have a different polit political philosophy than somebody else. I may think that there's a different approach to that. But you can foment that separation by effectively convincing me that the person that I am negotiating with is being dishonest, right? Yeah. That they are um, not coming to the table with good intentions. Mm -hmm. And I think more than anything else, that's largely what characterizes the current regime is just that we have begun to doubt each other's intentions, right? The, the, the term straw man or sea lion, et cetera, right? Trolling online. We've become a nation of people who are trying to make other people look silly 
and expose their ridiculous beliefs rather than trying to find common ground and negotiate in a manner that moves us forward. And I actually think that is one of the primary vectors that China is exploiting. I happen to have a reasonable social media presence. I see on a continual basis the Chinese bots come in anytime I try to say, you know, something of, of potential ramifications to China or things that are of interest to China. You'd be shocked at the number of Chinese bots that show up that effectively try to, you know, redirect that conversation, sound bite it, et cetera. Yeah. I mean, I think we'll we'll get into this when we talk maybe a little bit about, about history. And here I was just bragging about being a classics major and you're going to totally school me on uh, Roman history. But uh, I, I do think, you know, when I think about the biggest challenges that the United States faces today, I think about income inequality. And when you look at previous periods of history of, let's call it disruption, right, to use probably a, a candy coated word, they're almost always preceded by record periods of income inequality. And you know, you can look at that and say, hey, look at the data, this is what tends to happen. But just from a human standpoint, there's only so long, right? The perception of wealth and and just feeling good, it's relevant, right? Um, so I, I don't know. I mean, when you think about vectors or what are the most important problems that the United States needs to solve today? I mean, do you agree with that? Are there other things that we should be focusing on? Um, I don't know. What do you think? Well, so so the United States, I mean, I think we have to be very careful and it's, it's, again, not dissimilar to the experience that prior societies have had, right? So um, inevitably, as a society, you step in and you display, you either step into truly virgin territory where there's a surplus of land that's never been discovered, et cetera, right? That's obviously not what happened with the United States, but you know the unfortunate byproduct of smallpox and other diseases was we depopulated North America, right? And created an extraordinary land surplus for anyone that wanted to come here. Australia had similar characteristics. Obviously, Canada had similar characteristics as well, although a far less of their land is available because of the latitude that they exist at. So w when you have that type of extraordinary liberating of resources, and, and I, again, I understand politically that is not the right term. It's about as far from politically correct as you can get. But when an event like that occurs, it creates surplus and effectively raises the labor, ca the capital labor ratio, land being thought of as a component of capital or a factor of production, and creates the surplus that allows a society to flourish and thrive. Right? That path is largely closed. There is no undiscovered country in the United States anymore. There is no area with massive amounts of land surplus that can provide very inexp inexpensive housing for surplus children that are created around the world that want to come for economic freedom. Right. So we need to rethink what factor of production we're going to liberate and what we're going to change in terms of the equation of output. Right. So there's only three factors you have. You have land, capital and labor. Mm -hmm. Right. With, I would argue, energy effectively or technology could be a proxy for energy being you know, the combinatorial tool that allows them to all come together. Most of those, we don't really have any ability to grow dramatically, right? The labor factor in the United States could be marginally grown by immigration, but not dramatically. The capital factor, we see tremendous evidence of surplus or that it, at least at minimum, it is improperly allocated, right? So, you know, we have um, taken a lot of the capital investment, shifted it over to places like China. We can engage, we can experience a moderate boom as we reshore that, but there's going to be costs of, of the, the frictions associated with that. To me, it's very straightforward. As a society, we need to focus on improving the quality of our human capital and improving the flexibility that that human capital has for the capacity for um, effectively recombining itself in different manners, right? So younger people need to have the flexibility to think innovative, innovatively and free up resources that are currently consumed in somewhat pointless exercises, right? Somebody folding t-shirts at the gap is probably not the single best use of a human being in terms of a retail context, right? Amazon is providing a path for us to reduce some of those components. We just haven't figured out what to do with that labor surplus yet. That's what unemployment means, right? And the other area is energy, right? So we're currently very focused on the idea of conservation of energy, and we're currently very focused on the idea of changing the character of our energy profile. But I would actually suggest that what we need to be focused on is changing the character of that energy profile and providing dramatically more energy, right? So effectively, people can begin to do things that they couldn't even have imagined in the past. 
the best example of that would be something like the internet, right? I remember in the early stages of the internet, if you wanted to do anything, this is the whole business idea behind firms like Global Crosses, Crossing, et cetera, you would need to go to the phone company and pay a premium for a high-speed brand uh, uh, broadband, right? right. Like $800 per kilobit because it was being priced at a similar level to voice, right? That lowered to $300 per kilobit, which was the model for um, Global Crossing. Today, we're at pennies per megabyte, right? Mm. Um, so, you know, roughly a 3,000-fold improvement in the cost. And that means that you and I can have a video conversation where neither one of us is paying for premium video equipment, right? Um, mm. Effectively, I can travel to your location, you can travel to my location at a fraction of the cost, both in terms of the time, right? So I show up three minutes late to this interview and there's no problem because we have complete flexibility around it. Likewise, I didn't have to go to an airport, et cetera, right? That's a liberating of human capital and human resources that can be used more effectively in our society. That's where I wanna see us push. I'd love to see us go in that direction. And green is part of it because you do need to actually recognize that if you were to try to dramatically increase those energy resources with the polluting technologies that we have today, we would overwhelm the world in terms of it, its dynamics. So we do need to pursue components of green, but we do need to actually figure out how to increase the energy density. We do need to figure out how to increase the absolute quantity of energy that's available so we can do more with what we have. Absolutely. You know, it's funny, when you look over the course of, let's say, from 1980, Right. If you look at the growth of China versus the United States, obviously just top line growth in China from a GDP perspective is happening much faster. But you've also seen 850 million people get lifted out of poverty. Um, in 1994, I just I keep referencing this interview because it's just so amazing to me. There was a, a British financier, James, James Goldsmith. Goldsmith. Yeah. yeah. Um, and he went on Charlie Rose and he basically talked about global free trade. And it is incredible. I mean, the argument that he gets up and makes is very prescient. Um, it's very, I mean, it's ex exactly what ends up happening. But to me, the argument against him from this probably well intentioned, maybe, um, I don't know, economist, bureaucrat uh, type person. It is just fascinating to watch. And what it's looked like, if you looked at the blueprint, right, what was the brand of the United States back in the 40s and 50s, we were entrepreneurial, we were a small business, we were a pull yourself up by your bootstrap and actually create something. And we can talk about the GI Bill and some of the actual, um, you know, programs that incentivize that. But that was the brand of the United States. And it looks like what we've done is we've shipped a lot of that over to China. I actually love that analogy that you just used about the Roman Empire, kind of bringing labor in like, that is exactly mm -hmm. what happened, right? And it looked like we took, you know, the core thing of what made the United States good. And we just plopped it over in another country. And at some point we need to pay the piper for that, right? And their ramifications. So how do we get back to a positive track, I guess? Yeah. So, so you know, the, the, the challenge is twofold, right? Um, one is there's a legitimate complaint um, that says, hey, um, you've imported all these slaves, right? And mm -hmm. stolen my uh, role in Roman society, right? Same argument effectively that you hear behind many of the supporters of Donald Trump Right, who were treated as deplorables by the Democratic Party in the 2016 election, right? That's what a terrible, terrible thing to think of your fellow citizens, right? And within the Republican Party, we'll turn around and we'll say 43% or 47% of Americans don't pay any taxes, right? They're freeloaders, right? Well, that's obviously not true because that's not how an economy works, right? An economy is just people doing favors for other people. If there's a surplus that the government can extract, great. Right. That means the government is doing its job well, but for a mm. sizable fraction of the U.S. population, they aren't doing their job. And those people are not capable of contributing because they're barely keeping their head above water, certainly by the standards of their peers, which is all that matters. I could care. You know, right. You're, you're too young to remember your parents admonishing that there were people starving in China. Therefore, you should finish your you, know, you should clean your plate. Um, it's irrelevant. Right. What am I going to do? Give them my scraps? Um, you know, I can't transport it over there. But that type of um, that type of you know uh, uncertainty in a role in society is something that an increasing fraction of Americans are struggling with. And again, it echoes the dynamics of that period of transition from the Roman Republic to the Roman Empire, where the rise of Caesar was built around populism and a debt jubilee, you know, forgiving people of the debts that they owed to the ruling class. 
Mm. I think this is very similar. And I think, you know, the problem is, is that you're pitched the story of Adam Smith and free markets, et cetera. And what Sir James Goldsmith was pointing out is that's all wonderful if everything can move with absolute fluidity. But if you give capital the ability to move with fluidity on a global basis, and yet labor is restricted, labor. Right. right? you're going to ultimately create the conditions that he forecast and that largely is what we see today. And everybody hates the idea of increased regulation and increased restrictions on the free movement of capital. But it becomes really, really important if you actually start thinking about what the objective function of a government is supposed to be, which is to maximize the welfare and benefit of the citizens by not absolute numbers, which is what leads to concentration of wealth in the hands of a few, and instead to maximize the benefit for all, right? Or at least that's yeah. the idea behind a republic or a democracy. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit about the monetary system and the role here. I'm very curious if you agree with this analogy in general, but one, um, one analogy that's really resonated with me is looking at the reserve currency or essentially being the issuer of the global reserve currency as being a form of financial Dutch disease, right? Mm -hmm. And essentially, if you were involved in the exportation of dollars in the form of treasuries for the past 30, 40, 50 years, you've done extremely well. But essentially what that's done is it's strengthened the dollar to the detriment of anyone who's exporting actual products from the United States. Um, do you agree with that analogy overall, or is that kind of oversimplification? I think there's a degree of oversimplification, but I do think ultimately that the point is valid, right? So yeah. um, the emphasis that I would, would make on that is is the idea of a Dutch disease is really what's called Baumol's cost disease, right? Which is mm -hmm. that the most productive sectors of the economy effectively force prices to rise in other sectors of the economy or costs to right. rise in other sectors of the economy making them uncompetitive, right? So the, the non-exported sector, you see this most classically in things like healthcare or education, where we can't really export that product, although education we've done, a, uh, particularly at the tertiary level, college level, we've done a, a, a nice job of exporting that to Chinese nationals to come over and pay full freight, um, which has spoiled the system in a, in, a, in a wide variety of ways as well. Um, but when you have that type of characteristic, Yes, you know, the idea that you have the global reserve currency by definition means that you need to create an umbrella for everybody else, all the supplicants around the world, which is really what they are. And it's offensive. And I understand that. And I apologize in advance at any offense that I've done to it. But that is what it is. They are client states to the United States. We need to give them a mechanism to pay taxes to us. Right. And the taxes that we extract from them, it used to be in the form of, you know, um, they would literally, you know, show up with with wheelbarrows filled with gold that they had raised from their population. Right. That's the tax farmers from the Roman Republic. Today, it's in the form of underpriced refrigerators and hot tubs and furniture and tennis shoes. Right. Mm. So they sell the labor of their economy to us in a much more direct fashion than we would have historically, largely because of the technological innovations around things like containerization, et cetera, right? So the logistics function is much greater today than it would have been 2,000 years ago, fortunately. So it's the same thing. They are paying tribute to us. It just comes in the form of tennis shoes as compared to slightly tarnished silver. Yeah. But who does that really benefit at the end of the day, it right? The I mean, senatorial class, the, the elite right. class, right? And so the elite class looks at this and says, what are you people complaining about? You know, we are providing you with cheaper tennis shoes than you could have had in any other fashion. And people are like, look, I totally agree. Tennis shoes are a necessity in today's world, right? Because I, or sneakers, as my wife would call them. She gets annoyed when I say tennis shoes. Um, it's a West Coast phenomenon. Um, the, uh, the, the dynamic is, you know, hey, I need those sneakers because I need to prepare my kids for gladiatorial combat. That's the only way that they can, you know, gain access to the upper levels. We call that NCAA sports scholarships, right? Um, so like that's, that's the world that we increasingly have it. And people are understandably frustrated with it. So when you look back, I don't know, like a month ago, Peter Thiel was talking about um, kind of the monetary system and he made these comments about Bitcoin and basically called it a Chinese financial weapon against the United States potentially. He said two really interesting things, uh, which one, the euro and Bitcoin could both be considered weapons against the yeah. United States in that it's not in the strategic interest of, of the US, right? Um, and I totally agree because it's a, it's a strong tool for us basically being the issuer of the global reserve currency. He also said at the same time that China would not want to be the issuer of 
the global reserve currency at the same time. Which is always a really interesting follow-up to that, basically. Um, and I've got this analogy, so, so bear with me here, but uh, Dave Chappelle said this, he brought up this analogy that's just stuck with me my like entire life, ever since I, I heard I'm it. I'm a little impressed, by the way, to link Peter Thiel and Dave Chappelle is in, in a paragraph. That's pretty good, but anyway. <laughs> well, yeah, it's not done yet, so we'll see. Uh, see if you're still smiling. But um, Dave Chappelle said, you know, he walked away from this huge deal at Comedy Central, right? Remember, he's this huge deal. He was coming off the Chappelle show. They were going to give him like $40 million, and he walked away. And everyone's like, why'd you do that? And he gave this interview a little while later, and he used this unbelievable analogy. You know, he's watching this nature show, and they're talking about the Bushman and the baboon, right? And what Bushmen did to find water was they would actually use baboons. And baboons love salt, apparently. So what they would do is they would put salt in these little holes, and the baboon would reach in to grab the salt, but it makes, it makes their hand expand so they would get trapped. And if a baboon was smart, the only thing that he would have to do is release the salt, right? But they don't do that. So that's how the Bushmen actually find and trap the baboons and get led to water. And what Dave Chappelle said was, I felt like I was trapped. I was the baboon in this analogy. And to bring this full circle back to Peter Thiel in the United States, I feel like within the context of the global monetary system, the U.S. is the baboon. And there are undoubtedly benefits to being the issuer of the reserve currency, right? We can get into what some of those are, but ultimately they are killing themselves by doing this because the real vector that we're talking about is inequality in the US and empires crumble. I'm a firm believer that empires crumble from within, not from without. And to me, you are clinging to the power of being the issuer of the global reserve currency, but you're slowly killing yourself in the process. So, um, the, so the story of the baboons, I, I still don't understand how you get to water from that. And so, <laughs> you know, how so then once they have the baboons, the baboons lead the Bushmen to the water. That is the final, yeah, that was the final bit. <laughs> so, so, so they domesticate the baboon once you capture it or? or? Yeah, I guess they, yeah. Or they can't find, so this is like in Africa, these bushes yeah. in Africa, basically. And they, they capture the, the baboon. The story they... feels incomplete, but irrelevant at this point, right? Um, <laughs> right, so right. Let's, not, let's, let's not spend our time on that. But, um, but now I am intrigued as to how you use a wild baboon once you've trapped it, right? It feels to me like a tiger by the tail. Um, yeah, probably. The... Um, I, so I, I think there's definitely truth to that, right? I mean, the, the benefits that you have of being the global reserve currency um, are that the rest of the world needs to obtain your currency to effectively function within it as you, know, you, you become the global hegemon, right? It belongs mm -hmm. to you. Um, and it is necessary to use your currency to transact in order to obtain the goods and services that you can then uh, return in the form of tribute, as we were discussing earlier. The reason the euro is a financial weapon and the reason why um, the Chinese yuan can be viewed as a financial weapon or Bitcoin can be used as a financial weapon is because they effectively create, they theoretically create communities similar to a Coasian theory of a firm, right, where you don't yeah. need dollars to transact in that region. So what used to require dollars to transact between France and Germany now does not because they share a common currency. And so that reduces the role and your ability to lay taxes in the form of the empire, right? Render unto Caesar what is Caesar's. You're taking mm -hmm. away a segment of that, that economic operating sphere. Bitcoin, I think, is a little different. And I just want to emphasize that. So, so the euro clearly plays that role. There's theoretically the possibility for Bitcoin to play that role within the you know, internet sphere, although the evidence of Bitcoin's use as a transaction mechanism is slim and none, right? Mm -hmm. So it has largely become a speculative store of wealth. My view is, is that Peter was referring to a different type of economic weapon, right? Where mm -hmm. the asset Bitcoin, right? The dollar value of that 1.2 trillion or whatever it is at this point um, is largely tied to um, the U.S., economic fortunes, particularly concentrated in your demographic, right? So, you know, the kind of 20 to 35 or 40 set has a far greater proportion of their assets in crypto or crypto type assets relative to any other generational set. And that concentration of wealth within that asset class is actually reasonably significant. It's becoming a, a pretty big deal for that subsegment. Certainly in terms of, of the opportunity set or what is perceived as the opportunity set. It, I, I think what Peter is saying, and it's what I've said elsewhere and, and will continue to echo, is that you can use the price of that asset and the ability to manipulate it either up or down 
to foment further disruption and distress in the United States. And, in, and mm -hmm. it's particularly effective because it's targeting a group that is already disaffected, right? That already feels that asset price appreciation has meant that they are delayed in household formation. They can't afford houses. They can't afford to send their kids to good schools. They can't afford homes in good areas. The jobs that they're getting are less than what they were promised. They were put into debt, you know, various forms of, of serfdom through debt contracts that they entered into to obtain you know, the uh, relatively useless training at the tertiary level, we call that student loan debt, which is non-dischargeable, right? I mean, yeah. everything we were talking about before, the U.S. has literally flipped from the give me your tired, poor, huddled masses yearning to be free and giving them the opportunity for freedom. And instead, we've set a path forward that we label to people, this is the correct path, and it involves you becoming a debt slave in the form of, of non-dischargeable student loan debt that can only be paid off by seeking employment in the corporate sector because the private, you know, the entrepreneurial dynamics have largely been shut off. I mean, yeah. you, you, I talked about this in another podcast, but the statistics of the GI Bill, which took our returning soldiers and gifted them effectively a higher education, right? The, the rates of entrepreneurship amongst that subclass were nearly 50%, I think 45%. Today, the aggregate rates of entrepreneurship in our overall economy are around 5%. And crazily enough, we include ridiculous things like Uber drivers in you know, components of that entrepreneurship. I am so glad that you brought this up, actually. I, it's actually one of my biggest worries in general is if you look at how... Um, inequality gets reset over the course of history, oftentimes war is a primary component to that. And if you look at the GI Bill in the US, um, that was one of the greatest wealth transfers in history. Mm -hmm. And you know, you kind of outlined these. So there was obviously uh, easy access to credit for entrepreneurs, right? There was also heavily subsidized education and there was access to housing in the form of really subsidized mortgage rates and like zero uh, required deposit basically to move into homes. And you know, Warren Buffett, has this idea about a bubbles, which most bubbles are a good idea that's carried to excess. Those were, when they were trying to reset or give a gift to the soldiers who fought in the war, they had a very good understanding of social lubricant, right? What it takes to progress in terms of your life. They clearly defined it in that bill. And if you look at today, the price of a house is completely unaffordable for millennials, right? Uh, if you look at access to credit, Banks do not lend to small business owners anymore, and the cost of education is a complete joke. My, so I went to college at Emory University down in Atlanta. When I went, it was a ludicrous sum of money. It was like $68,000 a year. It's $85,000 a year now. That's completely unaffordable. The average salary that someone achieves, a college graduate, is $50,000. That idea of saving up to education, that doesn't exist anymore. That doesn't exist. Yeah, I, I mean, um, the 60,000 sounds insane. Um, unfortunately, uh, starting next year, I'll be paying, you know, multiple of those tuitions, and it only gets worse the year after that. But, um, yeah, right. you know, I'm, I'm incredibly fortunate that we've been able to, you know, uh, create the opportunity for our children to avoid that and to avoid the debt. But, you know, again, the language that we use, we talk about financial aid offsetting those costs, and included in that financial aid is loans. Right, it's debt. Right. That's not aid. Right. That's a you know this is a, this is completely insane. We're asking seventeen-year-olds yeah. to make a decision about how they want to live their life. We're calling something aid that includes a debt contract that is non-dischargeable. That in many situations is actually used to entrap the parents. Right, creating financial stress and you know conditions that lead to higher rates of dropping out, which is really where the student loan crisis is. It's not. Right. You know, those who go to school, get good degrees and get good jobs, they tend to be fine, right? The firm SoFi actually built itself around the idea of refinancing those individuals that they refer to as Henry's, high earning, not rich yet, right? Um, the, I've never heard that. Actually. Yeah, it's a great expression, right? But their, their yeah. whole point is if you go to Harvard and you get a degree in economics and you have a 3.5 GPA coming out of Harvard, your prospects are not remotely similar to somebody who goes to, and people have heard me use this language, I apologize, but you know, East Bumblefuck University where you stutter, study French medieval literature and underwater basket weaving, right? Um, you know, the student loan market provides no signal of the value differential between those two. They treat them yeah. as identical. They treat your living expenses when you go off to East BU, right? 
and you end up, you know, living in the dorms and partying hardy for four years, graduating in six, right? They treat all of that as effectively a deferred investment in human capital when really what it is is the destruction of brain cells in many situations, right, through mm. excessive alcohol and, and uh, drug consumption, right? It's a socialization exercise that's akin to sending your kid on a world tour you know, um, the grand tour that was reserved for the elites, you know, in the 19th century and was basically a way to say, you know, go off and waste some of the family money while becoming, you know, um, slightly more mature in the process, right? We're doing that with all of our children, most of whom lack the mentorship from either a family that has attended multiple, you know, generations of college or has a degree of entrepreneurship and is able to say, look, this is how the business world actually works. Here's how to prepare yourself for the next stage of your career. We treat them as totally separate and tell them, you know, go study what you love, go, you know, borrow money to finance your lifestyle when you're in college. And then they're suddenly shocked when they graduate, they've got $60,000, $70,000 worth of debt in a good situation. If you fail to graduate, you still have that $60,000, $70,000 worth of debt, and you have no prospect for improved employment prospects. Right? It's, yeah. it's a terrible, terrible system. Yeah, I no, I completely agree. Um, the thing about underwater basket weaving, though, is I think it really teaches you how to think instead yeah, of uh, exactly. what to do. <laughs> yeah, how to hold your yeah, breath, it's... but yeah. Yeah, how to hold, yeah. I, yeah, I, I completely agree with you. I think it's really, you need to, you know, I did take, um, as, as a classics major, you psych major. Twice I, now. Yeah, no, I'm joking. <laughs> you, you were so right to call me out on that. Oh, my God. Um, but I, uh, you know, I, I did go into college thinking I was going to be really interested in philosophy. I didn't really know what I wanted to do. Lots of kids, when they go into no. college, they don't really have an understanding of what they're going to be interested in. Uh, I took a lot of uh, philosophy classes. There was a great Onion article on philosophy classes. A uh, kid in philosophy class needs to shut the fuck up. Yeah. And that's generally what I found yeah. uh, to be true. But there were a couple of great moments. And I, you know, I've looked for this, this philosophical approach. But basically, one philosophy to strive for is that in order to create a good society, you need to give people the tools to access what their ideal is. Yep. And my the problem for me when I look around at American society today is it does not feel like that is the case anymore. Um, well, what we've given people are the tools to give them a window into the life that they would desire, right? So you go on Instagram and you get to see yeah, and you right. feel like you're friends with somebody who's living a life that, you know, I mean, the irony, you, you sit there watching, uh, people actually paying to just take a picture of themselves getting off of a private plane as compared to actually traveling on the private jet, right? You know, it's like this, this terrible window into a fake view of what success looks like in our society. Um, and, and we've given them the tools for that, right? When you turn on the TV and you watch a cop show and you see a cop in New York City living in a fantastic apartment, like it never enters your mind, like, okay, that's actually a, a television set. That's not really an apartment that a, you know, sergeant can afford in, uh, in New York City or even Long Island City for that matter. Um, we're, we're given these windows into this world that makes us think that we are failures on one part and also participating in another. And, and it's not the same as giving them the tools for success. Yeah. And I think you're seeing this play out as well across a whole bunch of different spectrums. And I think what the world has started to do is basically adopt this long volatility strategy across a whole bunch of different spectrums of society because people don't see the path anymore, right? To just, hey, if I just follow this, I will achieve my goals. So, you know, not to get super political here, but like if you look at Trump, I think that was long vol. You see, saw a lot of people that were not happy with their place in the system. And they kind of looked at this guy and said, at least this is going to be different from the status quo. Yep. You see that across GameStop. You see that across crypto. This is the, this is all a manifestation of the same thing, which is the entire world going long vol because people aren't happy with their current place in society. I, I think that's right. You, you know, we have this conversation at Simplify on a fairly regular basis. We, we um, offer ETFs that have derivative components to them that allow us to change the payoff profile. Right. So. Mm. One of the ways that that payoff profile can be changed is by introducing what's referred to convexity, the ability to make more and lose less by introducing curves to a straight line, right? Mm -hmm. um, you can do that with your income. You can think about convexity in your income as there's different ways that you could do that. You can do mm -hmm. that with 
a high probability small impact. You save a portion of your income, you put it into the bank, it generates small interest, and over time, or you put it into the stock market, and over yeah. time it generates an increasing source of income that is unassociated with your individual effort. When individuals feel that that is not enough convexity to offset the diminished labor prospects that they have, they begin to reach for more extreme forms of convexity, right? At the most extreme form, I can introduce incredible convexity to my income stream by taking a fraction of my earnings every two week pay period and deploying it into the California Mega Millions lottery, right? Now, right. the, the prospect of realization of that is very, very low, right? The mm. idea, the frequency with which that will succeed is low, but in a world in which there's an unlimited number of observations, right? Somebody is going to show incredible convexity to their income because they've won the lottery. That, right. in my opinion, that frustration, that, you know, borderline nihilism of the only possible way for me to improve my situation is by engaging in an activity that has extreme convexity to it, right? That is a reflection of the desperation that people see. Yeah, yeah, I completely agree. Um, and you can see that, honestly, with something like Dogecoin. Yeah. Um, I, yeah, I mean, I also just think there's an element of nihilism to it too, right? Which is the same thing that causes people when they're rioting to burn their own neighborhoods, right? You know, it's just, there, there and, and I do think that we are approaching this point where it's, you know, an element of, you know, burn, baby, burn sort of thing, just losing yeah. control of the underlining emotional content. Um, it's, you know, again, you know, one, one of my, my wife's many complaints against me is that I, I tend to have low emotional content and reaction to stuff. I think that works well in an, in, in an investment framework, but people are understandably frustrated and a little panicked by the future. And when you feel that you when know, your cortisol levels are rising, when your stress is rising, right, you lash out and try just to do something different. I think you, you nailed the phenomenon of, of Donald Trump almost perfectly. Drain the swamp, right? I mean, do you put a swamp creature in to drain the swamp? No, you put somebody in who you think has no ties to that insider component. And that lack of ties to the insider component, I think, contributed to the ineffectiveness of the Trump administration. Effectively, you know, nobody wanted to work with him within the system. Whether his policies were good or bad became irrelevant under those conditions. I, I would suggest we flipped that this time around, where now we have the ultimate insider in the form of Joe Biden, who on an individual basis is extremely ineffectual to the point that nobody's really seen him in his first hundred days. But bizarrely, the systems of governance are now working better because people are, by and large, saying we don't have this outside influence that we have to contend with. We're just going to get busy doing what we want to do. Yeah. When you look at so I know you're a, a fourth turning guy. For me, when I look at a lot of what's happening in the world right now, you look at people are abandoning institutions across a whole bunch of different levels. Right. There's a record mistrust just in terms of government. Uh, we've been talking about that a little bit. Um, there's a mistrust in the banking system, right? And you can look at Bitcoin and say it's a positive or a negative, but to me, that's an ultimate expression of mistrust in the banking system. There's a mistrust in media and there's a mistrust in the educational system. And I think what you're just seeing is people rejecting and, and opting out. And on the one hand, maybe you could spin that as being something positive, right? Um, but it's also, it's really concerning for me. It's just concerning. Mm -hmm. I, I look around and I see like those periods, let's call them transition periods, so I'll give you two examples and maybe we can get into history here a little bit. Um, but there's a great book, Lessons of History, really, really short. It's like 120 pages um, of some really great succinct lessons across history. Um, and there's this one paragraph, uh, you know, coming from ancient Greece, uh, where there's basically, you know, again, record income inequality. They talk about bringing in this King Solon and basically they introduce a lot of what we're seeing today, right? There's reforms in terms of taxation, um, all this other kind of stuff to basically redistribute wealth. And that actually avoids a lot of major conflict at that time. In other periods of time, you could look at ancient Rome and you could, uh, I know you want, maybe want to start a little bit earlier than what I was talking about, but I was actually talking about the eventual decline of the Western Roman Empire in the third century um, where you saw a lot of what we're seeing today. You saw debasement of the coinage, you saw more intervention of government, you saw uh, corrupt and inept bureaucracy, and eventually that kind of ended up 
taking down the entire system. Uh, and that devolved in, in civil war and the eventual capitulation of a centuries old empire. So this is my long rambling way of saying these trans these transitions in history are often not times that you want to live through. And to me, I guess I, the only point here is I look out and I'm just a little concerned with what I'm seeing. Well, so, so again, I always try to reorient people to a much earlier time period, right? So I, I, right. I think the analogy of the fall of the empire is, is probably wrong, right? Mm -hmm. um, if we are truly an empire, we are the most you know, munificent and beneficial empire the world has ever seen. And I understand, yeah. again, people will take offense at that, but it just doesn't match with what I see, right? Um, I, I'm much more concerned about the potential loss of the Republic and the idea that our governing institutions are increasingly ineffectual. You mentioned the, the Greek example, right? King Solon was brought on um, at the end of democracy, right? Because we yeah. recognize that the, the you know, uh, representative forms of government were not working effectively. They did not have good tools to stand against corruption. The United States is one of the exceptions in history where a um, executive uh, was given the opportunity to conduct a, a coup against a democratic system. George Washington could have become the new king of America had he wanted to and chose to not do that. They chose to make the sacrifices at the elite level rather than saying, and, and there, you know, the, the dynamics of, of the founding fathers documents, you know, Madison's an excess of democracy, et cetera, are very clear that they understood there was a balance between the will of the mob and the the overarching power of an individual executive, right? Which we just call a king or a dictator or whatever, right? right. You know, my sense is is that we are probably going to end up making a similar choice because we are so divided, because we are incapable of making collective decisions and advancing the center of the agenda, right? The things like I love my kid, you love your kid sort of stuff. Right. Let's all make sure that they're better off. We're finding ourselves incapable of advancing the center of that agenda that's typically where a dictator or a king comes in, right? I'm going to make the hard choices. I'm going to decide who's going to sacrifice and who's going to be um, appropriately raised up, who's going to be brought down to a certain extent to facilitate this. You see this within the oligarch system in, in Russia, right? I mean, the mm -hmm. oligarch system had gotten out of control. They elevate Putin to be effectively emperor, right? And so, you know, that creates a check on the oligarchs. Um, we're there's a lot of risk that we're headed towards that path, right? The, the lack of influence that the standard U.S. citizen has on the oligarchs as we have them in our society today leads to a feeling of abandonment. And so, you know, there can be all sorts of giving pledges and I'm going to give away half my wealth, et cetera, and, you know, blah, blah, blah. We treat it with a degree of cynicism that we would have the same gifts from Crassus uh, in the Roman era, right? Whereas, right. you know, not good enough, guys. You you know, ultimately, you're going to have to make much, much, much bigger sacrifices. And this is one of the messages that I try to convey to people is just that, you know, unless we start working towards that dynamic, the social war type, type dynamic of the Roman uh, Republic transition to empire, we're going to end up in the same place. Yeah. Can you take people for those who might uh, not be as familiar with that transition, <laughs> that, tra that particular transition period in history? Talk, what was the scene back then? Like, what, what were some of the, the lead ups to that eventual transition? Well, like, like the, you know, I mean, so first of all, I just want to emphasize that history tends to rhyme, not repeat, right? And right. so there are patterns of history that are very, very similar. Rome, like the United States, gained control of effectively an island or a very well defensible peninsula in the form of the Italian peninsula that gave them a base of operations from which to launch in you know, all sorts of activities around the Mediterranean. You know, so it, again, going back to the analogy I raised with China and the United States, Rome had very few physical neighbors that it had to continually contend with. The Alps created a geographical barrier that you know, Hannibal was able to, to uh, surmount, but the resources required to mount an attack on Rome were so significant that it was effectively a defensible base of operations. Same thing that the United States has today. The rest of the Mediterranean had all sorts of competitors that they were, they were forced to deal with, right? When Carthage was defeated, which was the primary opponent on the other side of the Mediterranean, it opened up an avenue of conquest and exploration that, as we talked about, brought in tons of slaves, brought in you know um, a, a surplus of the labor resource, and in that environment, you began to experience the 
ill effects of rising wealth inequality, right? Right. Um, and once Rome effectively won, then Rome itself, the senatorial class, increasingly became corrupt and for sale, right? And so the, the time period that I think is most similar to what we're dealing with on a political sphere right now is, is what's referred to as the Yurgothene War, um, which refers to a, uh, a um, warlord prince from, uh, I believe it was Numibia, um, that defied the edicts of Rome. His father had, quote unquote, gifted the kingdom to a Roman protectorate. Rome declared, okay, you and your two brothers are going to get along and split up this kingdom. And for Jugurtha, that wasn't, a, that wasn't acceptable. He immediately killed off one of his brothers, began war against another. His remaining brother, you know, uh, went to the Senate and said, you know, hey, you know, this is being done in defiance of, of your edicts. And Jugurtha showed up with chests of gold and just bought the senatorial class, right? Literally mm -hmm. just bought the senatorial class. I would suggest that China is doing something very similar, where the resources of 1.4 billion people create an incredible amount of um, potential grifting or tribute um, in the same manner that you would have seen chests of gold extracted from the populace of Jugurtha um, or for the conquest of his brother's kingdom, right? Those sorts of dynamics create the potential for corruption in a way that, that um, nobody really thinks of it in that manner, right? It's not like I'm intentionally doing the bidding of China and therefore, I'm right. you know uh, acting against the interests of the United States. I doubt there's a single senator or a congressperson or even lobbyist, for that matter, that is actively saying, "Boy, I'm really excited to engage in seditious behavior." Right? Um, but it's the effect of paying somebody for a consulting relationship. Right? It's you know, help America understand our interests. You know, help America understand why this is. Um, a good thing, right? And we see that with the Confucius Institute. We see that in a variety of other manners where a sizable fraction of research in the United States, particularly in the social sciences, is actually being influenced in one form or another by foreign money. Uh, they mm -hmm. don't feel like they're engaging in seditious behavior. They're just doing what every macro investor does, taking a step back and approaching it from a globalist perspective and trying to understand you know, different perspectives. A piece just came out um, uh, I think it was Foreign Affairs magazine just came out um, saying, you know, hey, the U.S. should reevaluate its defense of Taiwan because we can't win. Right. I, I think there's extraordinary truth to that. Right. We probably can't win if China really decides that they want to take Taiwan. But that type of observation, that type of statement runs a very real risk of replacing American exceptionalism with American defeatism that opens up the rest of the world to bullying by players like China, right? If they decide to take Taiwan, then they're gonna take it. That then puts them on the same island hopping campaign that the, the Japanese found themselves in World War II, right? Jumping across to Manchuria, et cetera. It, it becomes a world that is a much, much, much more dangerous place. And yeah. you, you saw exactly these types of discussions in Rome where the Senator said, it's a long way away. Do we really want to send Roman troops? Is this really, you know, is this really our fight? Um, it's very similar. So help, help me like think this through. I genuinely don't have an answer. I'm just, I'm just asking this question because I don't know. When you look at various uh, periods of peace, right? There's like the Pax Romana, yep. right? And that, and the reason for that structure is because there's a, such a dominant military power that essentially no one challenged them. Then there was the Pax Britannica, right? And then there's the, we're arguably in, in or perhaps nearing the end of the Pax Americana. Mm -hmm. So on the one hand, you know, we've talked about how empires tend to actually crumble from internal purposes, but at the same time, they tend to get blamed on external reasons. Um, and so I'm curious from your standpoint, like where I see the world going is that there are a lot of structural problems with the economy and people don't have a good understanding of the, the point of having an economy and raising people up and the, in, to use your language, maximizing the value of each person, that's an internal United States based structural problem. But I feel like we're going to end up blaming China there. What's the way out of this is, I mean, should we kind of unite and say, hey, we want to maintain this dominant position to essentially usher in and, and oversee world peace? Or are we just near the end of that period? 
So I, I tend to lean towards the view, and this again goes back to my analogy of the Roman Republic as compared to the Roman Empire. I, I think that we are actually at the start of that transition. And that if I, if I fast forward 200 years from now, my expectation is, is that the United States could actually be significantly more dominant on the global stage than it is today. I think it's almost implausible that China plays a significant role. Um, the, oh, interesting. Okay. The, the, you know, when you think about what I referred to before as the factors of production, right, land, labor, energy, um, uh, and capital, China is structurally short of all of those, mm. right? Um, and they have degraded the quality of their land in their attempt to rapidly deploy their surplus labor that existed, as you pointed out, in 1972 and really accelerated in 1994. You know, right. Their desire to increase the energy component um, of the economy to facilitate the greater combinatorial factors has left their population facing an incredibly polluted landscape, et cetera, right? Uh, the labor has effectively voted and looked at the world that exists within China and said, we don't actually think there's the possibility of succeeding within this system, right? Mm. Um, when you, this is an argument that I had, uh, you know, back around the global financial crisis when the argument was China is the future, look at the investments that they make in their children they spend 40% of their household income educating their children. In the United States, we spend 40% on alcohol, cigarettes, beer, and various forms of drugs, right? Obviously, that's not true, and it's an overstatement. I just want to emphasize that. Um, the problem with spending 40% of your household income on educating your children is how many children can you have? Right. One, right? You can have one, because otherwise you're going to be spending 80%, which leaves nothing for yourself. And what happens to your individual standard of living? If you choose to check out of that system and not have children, well, that's 40% of your income that's now freed up for you to live your life how you would like to. And so what we've seen is the very predictable outcome that Chinese birth rates have collapsed. And broadly, we're seeing this around the world for similar but not quite as extreme reasons to the point the Chinese graduating high school classes are now somewhere in the neighborhood of 40 to 45% smaller than they were 25 years ago. That's going to create an incredible labor crunch that has an impact on two fronts. One is the productive capability, the factors of production dynamic again. And the second component is in the domestic aggregate demand, right? Because if I shrink the population by half, which is effectively what you're talking about doing over the next 100 years, and this is happening far more rapidly than any form of demography forecast would have had, because those all assume renormalization to replacement rate population going forward, um, you're basically saying there's no way for me to grow the domestic consumption story. And that then mm. forces China into a situation where the only path for growth is to capture an increasing share of what's happening around the world, right? Their export has to continue to grow as a fraction factor of their economy. It just can't happen. The rest of the world is inevitably going to rise up against that model, right? Mm. And, and they are a variant of the world reserve currency where they have to actually figure out things for a shrinking population to do. It's very similar to the problems that Japan had on its population dynamics. It creates the conditions of disinflationary characteristics, et cetera. It creates conditions in which people feel less vested in a society's future. If you don't have children, you feel far less vested, right? So all, all of these are issues that China has that I don't think they have a good answer for other than increased authoritarianism and penalties associated with failing to participate in one form or another. Um, the United States has the potential to continue to grow. And while I complain about the lack of resources that are available, the relative sourcing of resources for the US population versus the rest of the world is actually remarkable, right? We, we have an energy surplus even in the fossil fuels category. That's before we begin to tap into the sizable quantities of nuclear, et cetera, geothermal that exist within the United States. Um, and we also have a, a, a currently growing population, both domestically and in terms of, of immigration. Uh, that's a far more robust system. And my guess is we're going to see an increasing fraction of the narrative around the idea that China is going to bend towards the United States, but then pull away um, in the opposite direction, fall away. So this is what I'm actually looking for. They're never, in my analysis, going to replace the United States. I think that they know that, which is part of the reasons that such a sizable fraction of the resources that they're spending are actually designed to cause the United States to fragment. 
right? If you want to beat the United States, the only thing you can do is convince the citizens of the United States that we are an inherently immoral and evil society that should be fractured, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I think they're doing a pretty good job of convincing yeah. many parts of the US population that that's the case. I don't think it's true. I don't think we're any less moral than any other society. I think we're much more moral than many other societies. And on net, the flexibility and freedom of the United States has been a, a positive for the world. But I think right now we're distracted and not feeling that, right? Um, it's one of the things I try to encourage people to turn on to is the potential. There's an incredible amount of potential. We're not doing a good job of capturing it. Yeah. So. Let's talk like pragmatically here for a second. Let's say you, um, in a totally hypothetical scenario, you were the empire or dictator of the United States. What are some of the changes that you would make, right? How, how, do, we, how do we regain what it seems like we've at least temporarily lost? Well, I think the, the single biggest component is actually focusing on the dynamics that you're talking about, which is equality of opportunity, right? And not right. giving children, um, particularly those in the lower class, a status effectively as debt slaves. Right. Um, we need to recommit to educating and developing our human capital. We need to raise yeah. the resources that are available to our children. And that can be done in two ways. It can be done through efficiency. Right. And it can be done through increased dollars going to it. When you talk about a transition from a republic to an empire, what you're really talking about is not changing um, the resources that are provided to the government system but making them inherently more efficient, collapsing the discussion around, well, what are all the competing components to know the king gets to make the choice, right? That's a way of introducing efficiency oh. into a system. Um, and as a society, I think that that's unfortunately, again, why I'm very worried we're heading in that direction. We're gonna sacrifice the freedom for the efficiency because we can't contribute 50 plus percent of our economy to the functioning of the government, right? This is. Part of the reason I look with skepticism on the idea of, of you know, people convinced that we have MMT, modern, modern monetary theory, you know, adherence running the show. I just got a notification from, you know, the uh, Golden Gate uh, uh, Transit Authority, the Bay Area Transit Authority, that my, you know, uh, regular withdrawals for um, filling up my um, fast track for going over the Golden Gate Bridge has gone from $25 to $45, right? Well, mm. that's not stimulus. Right. That's austerity. Right. We're seeing the Biden administration propose a dramatic increase in taxes, whether those are good taxes or bad taxes, meaning are they redistributive in the manner that we talk about remains for debate. But we're talking about increasing austerity to having the government try to take more, increasing the taxation rates. I don't think that that's the right solution set. Um, I think the right solution set is let's figure out as a society how we take away some of the resources that we're using in unproductive manner, right, for the payment of bureaucracy, the government pensions, et cetera, um, and reorient that towards effective delivery of services that raise up the overall population, right? It's, it's ridiculous that we have a society in which individuals need to self-insure through the form of personal bankruptcy against health issues, right? I mean, yeah. like the, all these things create pitfalls there's a the, the great line from the, the TV series Game of Thrones, right, which is chaos is a ladder, right? Again, chaos is a ladder. If you fall off that ladder and are no longer able to climb, then you are useless as a form of human capital, right? And, and I say that with intentional severity because that's how we treat people, right? Pull yourself up by your bootstraps, but if you fall, it's just not your cup of tea, man. Sorry. Yeah, that's a, I was, you know, I was just having this conversation this week, actually, in, so my, my best friend from college, he's an English guy, and he said one of the, one of the big differences between the United States and um, just the general mentality over in the UK is that in the US, people attribute your success or failure to your own innate ability, when in reality, it doesn't quite work like that anymore. And there's no dignity in failure, essentially, is the result from that. Um, and dignity at the end of the day is one of the most important things I think that a society needs to also provide for. And you just don't really have access to that because in the United States, if you didn't succeed, it's exactly what you said. It wasn't your cup of tea. Sorry. You couldn't cut it. Couldn't hack yeah. it. Um, whereas in, in other cultures, you know, it's just, Hey, life is shit. 
it's all shit for all of us. So, you know, come on here, give us a big hug. And, you know, there are pros and cons. There are pros and cons to every single system. But th I think that's becoming a, a big shortfall at this particular moment in history. Well, they're also, I mean, you know, um, we have to be really careful in comparing the United States to many other countries, even countries that seem as closely comparable as the UK, for example, right? So mm -hmm. the heterogeneity of the US population is extraordinary on the global stage. So in the United mm -hmm. States, we talk realistically about the Caucasian population ceasing to be the majority, right? Within mm -hmm. the younger demographics, that's already the case. We have a relatively stable fraction that is is um, of different types of minorities and some that are growing quite rapidly, right? But the heterogeneity in terms of phenotype, skin color, eye color, um, uh, uh, geographic background, et cetera, is unparalleled around the world, right? If you look at Australia, for example, which you know many think of as, as, as a peer, the concentration of the white population is dramatically higher than it is in the United States. The concentration of people with an English background versus other backgrounds is dramatically higher. In Canada, you know, much as, as diverse as Canada is, particularly within its immigration policies, it is much less diverse as an actual underlying population. The UK is nowhere close to what the United States is. Part of the challenge is that that actually creates the potential for fractious victimization politics, right? You know, well, I, I'm not succeeding. The system's not working for me because it's inherently set up against me. Like any stereotype or any, you know, type of, of statement of that, there has to be an element of truth that allows people to buy into that, right? But I don't think that the right answer is, hey, it's, it's all shit. Let's all, you know, give it, go in for a group hug, yeah. right? Um, I would say that is a very English, you know, stiff upper lip, you know, it's all shit, you know, but we got to we got to proceed going on. I, I hope for better from the United States, which is to say, you know, look, the opportunity is there for us to improve things dramatically. But we need to have honest conversations about this stuff. We need to have an honest conversation with the capital class that says, and you're beginning to see this language, I applaud it coming from from the Biden administration. But if you're going to take a job and move it from the United States to the rest of the world, the United States citizens should be compensated for that in one form or another. And for you to further exacerbate it by picking up your tax base and dumping the intellectual property that was created in the United States and putting it into a low tax regime so you can do the, the Dutch flip or the, the uh, you know, take advantage of Ireland's, you know, low tax rates, that's absurd, right? It's completely absurd. I mean, a, a company like Apple, which has remarkable innovations and in technology. And again, Peter Thiel is on record saying that it's anti-innovation, which there's a lot of truth to when you create a walled garden, et cetera, right? But a company like Apple that actively engaged in um, wage suppression and um, limitations on recruiting its employees, um, you know, with Google and Facebook and others, right? They paid a $640 million fine. And that's sofa hmm. change to Apple. And they, it, you know, it, they admitted to the fact that they actively engaged in wage suppression for their employees. Like, that's insane to me. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, what you're essentially telling these businesses, right, even Facebook's record $5 billion fine that they paid recently. I mean, there's some, st what, what is that in terms of free cash flow for them? That's like, it's, it's a a si it's, no, 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 it's a, it's a sizable quantity of free cash flow. But yes, I agree with you. The punishment does not fit the crime. And part of that is, is that we actually, you know, the scale of the punishment that would be required, there's no reasonable dynamic in which you can say, you know, you should pay a $50 billion fine, right? I mean, that would, right. the, the amount of lawyers that you'd be able to employ to fight that, you know, in, in perpetuity would justify everything. The U.S. government itself doesn't want to devote the resources to trying to collect on that tax effectively. Right. Yeah. Create some weird incentives, for sure. Um, Mike, you've already been super generous uh, with your time here. Uh, we probably devoted less time to China than I thought. Yeah, it was no, it's, well, it's, it, 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 the problem is, is it's an integrative problem, right? So I China agree. is yeah. exploiting the issues that exist within our society to give the perception that the United States is, you know, no more moral than China is, right? And it's just a, an untrue statement. Um, mm -hmm. but it is exploitable because people can constantly do the what aboutism dynamic, right? You know, well, how can we point to China when the U S treated its native American population so badly? Well, okay. <laughs> yes, you can make arguments around those, but that doesn't actually make what China is doing today good. And what the United mm -hmm. States is trying to accomplish today 
in terms of addressing the issues of inequality, et cetera. I, I'm actually hopeful that we're going to make some progress on that. Um, but it, you know, there's, it's a choice and we don't know which yeah. way it's going to play out. Yeah. What, just to end on more, more of a hopeful note, yeah. actually, what are some of the things that you look around and see that makes you optimistic? What do, what do you kind of look at the macro landscape, stuff that's coming out from the go, what, whatever it is, what, what makes you hopeful, I guess, about the future? Well, one of my best friends is, is a VC named Josh Wolf, right? And so if, if you, oh, if you yeah. Google, Josh you know, Mike Green, Josh Wolf, you'll see any number of conversations that the two of us have. Um, you, you know, the point that I would make is, is that um, all of the concerns are fundamentally short human innovation. And the reason you kick the can down the road and you don't engage in the Andrew Mellon liquidate stocks, liquidate labor, et cetera, sort of framework that, you know, was perceived as the quote unquote right answer to the global financial crisis or, you know, et cetera, um, or the Great Depression, right? You know, if we just allowed the system to fail, we could have rebuilt it, right? The reason you don't do that is because that causes disruptive patterns to human innovation. It effectively creates a fracture or a break in, in a system. People innovate and create new ideas in stability, right? You can't spend time thinking about, okay, how do I um, create an automobile when you're trying to feed your family on a you know day-to-day -day basis, right? It requires surplus to sit there and do that. Um, what I'm hopeful for is that we're going to kick the can down the road with a degree of stability until that innovation is able to push us into a remarkably more productive formulation, right? Where we can take the exact same pieces, the radical material prosperity that we have, right? So, I mean, again, remember that, you know, 10,000 years ago, your ancestors would have been desperate to get a few grains of wheat to effectively create, you know, a rough bread right. to feed their family. And now we're really incensed that the price of filet mignon has risen relative to a base case, right? Um, we have a degree of surplus that we can use to continue to smooth the path. But if we decide to take that surplus and use it in either a, um, parasitic way where it's being stripped off to pad the nests of the extreme elite, or if it's being used to um, raise the standard of living without any investment for the rest of the population, then we'll continue to spiral down to the point of crisis. But I, I, I'm optimistic that among the other things that coronavirus might have woken up, is some awareness of the costs of our actions on the younger generation and some element of commitment to beginning to make those investments and improve those prospects. I'm, I'm hopeful on that. It's, it's stochastic. It's unknowable whether we'll continue down that path. I would suggest I see it in California, right? One of the reasons why the public sector rapidly got its act together again, got kids back in school was they could feel the parent revolt coming. Right? Like they were going to replace all the, the school board, you know, members, they were going to replace, you know, many of the dynamics that have led to stasis. They may have stepped in in time to stop that, that, that purge, but we as citizens, I, I would hope that we become vigilant and demand better. Yeah, absolutely. Well, you know, we might not have talked that much about China, but uh, it was a good conversation because I got to mention that as a classic major twice. Now it's there three times. Go. I was yeah. going for the hat trick. Now I am done. Now I'm done, I promise. Um, I want to give you a chance, though, to plug uh, Simplify because, you know, whenever I think Mike Green in my head, I think Logic of Fun. So tell yeah. me a little bit about this transition. To well, so Logic was a, was, a, um, uh, was, was a short stint um, where, you know, I had recognized that my views around the impact of passive create conditions under which derivatives are mispriced, right? So when you mm. change the market structure increasingly away from the efficient market hypothesis or the characteristics of an efficient market, by introducing a dominant player in the form of passive that just has a different rule set and therefore the market behaves in a different fashion, it creates the opportunity to exploit that. If I went back 12 months ago, the only way to do that was within the hedge fund framework. In September, October of last year, there was a regulatory change that now means that ETFs can actually incorporate derivative strategies, um, option type strategies, that couldn't be done before. And so um, the opportunity to transition into the ETF space, taking advantage of that superior ability to express derivatives that exists within the ETF space has opened up a much bigger opportunity. It's not simply one of taking advantage of this within the hedge fund framework, 
but it's actually about offering people superior vehicles at extraordinarily reasonable prices, right? So, you know, hedge fund is one and a half and 15 at Simplify, our products are offered at 28 basis points with payoff structures that are radically different than, than anything else that's available in the market. I can use derivative structures to change the performance of an ETF. An S&P ETF, I can give the upside without the downside characteristics. There's obviously costs associated with that. You get a different payout with some components to it. But because of my views on the dynamics of, of the influence of passive, I actually think we're buying these options. I think that the opportunity exists to buy these options at less than fair value. They provide resources that I think allow me to offset that and create a net really powerful vehicle. Combine that with some of the inherent efficiencies that ETFs have um, on the tax side. And I think we're re we really have the capability of offering what I referred to, what are referred to as dominant portfolios. They're just better structures. Uh, it's just a much, much bigger opportunity. And it's one that I, I'm incredibly excited to, to help go out and, and offer to the investment public. Absolutely. It sounds like really exciting stuff. Um, if people want to figure out more about or getting involved in Simplify, I guess, or speaking to you, like what's the best way to do that? So for most people, um, the the way that you would access Simplify is simply through because we offer ETFs, right? Um, you can you literally just go to your broker. The target right. market for Simplify and the reason I think of it as being called Simplify, and this is not universally true, is that we're really targeting the registered investment advisor community. Whether and that could be a robo advisor, sure. it can be an individual, but um, moving into the space and creating the opportunity to um, add value for investors in a way that simply can't be done elsewhere. Um, the registered investment advisor community, somebody who's advising you in your portfolio, if you wanted to include something like Bitcoin, right? So you hear people all the time talk about Bitcoin and say, you know, uh, well, you should just have a 1% allocation of Bitcoin. Well, how is your you know, how is your financial advisor supposed to maintain a 1% allocation in your portfolio, right? To something that has an 80% volatility, right? So it bounces all over the place. The amount of time right. they have to spend managing that position is greater than they would on the rest of the portfolio. And so it's just impractical, right? So we're introducing a product that facilitates an appropriate level of uh, diversification into products like crypto. Um, we also are introducing products that can replace the core of your portfolio. So it's effectively a pre-hedged S&P 500. Um, that is designed to help, again, the registered investment advisor who wants to offer clients the ability to participate in an equity market that I continue to think is being pushed higher by the dynamics of passive, among other things. But when you have that type of product and people, somebody wants to hedge it, Again, you're running into this problem of it is a very complex, high volatility sub portion of the portfolio that's typically one to two percent of the assets. It's just not practical to expect an RAA to be able to offer that. And so we're stepping into an, you know, what I would describe as a quote unquote niche that actually becomes a core portion of portfolios. And for the first time, in my opinion, creates actually a, a very real prospect of competing with the vanguards and Black Rocks of the world. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, well, look, Mike, thanks so much for telling us a little bit about what you do and, and giving us a lot of, I mean, you've certainly given me a, a lot to, a lot to think about here. Um, and this was a lot of fun. We'll have to do it Michael, again. Michael, I enjoyed it. It's always fun talking.